Thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode. Computers use energy. That probably isn't news to you. After all, we've all had that moment when we've forgotten our laptop charger or not been able to find a socket to save our dying smartphone. But have you ever wondered why? Hear me out. I'm not talking about the screen or the speakers or the motor in the disk drive. Things which have to actually physically do something. I'm talking about the processor, the part which does the thinking. Okay, what's the mystery here? The processor is still an electrical device and just like all electrical devices, light bulbs, microwaves, Teslas, it performs a task and in return needs energy. But the reason all those other devices need energy is because they output energy. The light bulb produces light to illuminate a room, the microwave produces heat to warm a meal, and the car produces kinetic energy to accelerate itself and its passengers. For each electrical device, there's a minimum energy it must use, otherwise it won't be able to do what it's designed to do. A portion of that energy is also wasted, getting lost to things like friction, vibration and heat. But the computer processor is different. Its function isn't to light up, heat something or move around. When we ask it to, say, calculate 41 times 76, we don't expect to get any kind of useful energy out. All we want is for it to manipulate information to flip a set of ones and zeros and give us our answer. So does this mean that the energy used by the processor is just wasted energy? If we imagine a world where these sources of loss and inefficiency are removed, could a computer run on no energy at all? It turns out that the answer is no. Amazingly, information itself has its own energy cost. This cost is set by a principle known as the Landauer limit which states that the minimum energy needed to flip one bit of information is equal to this number. This is the energy which no modern computer can go below. And in this video, we're going to see where this limit comes from and how, just maybe, we could one day break it. To begin, we have to ask, what does a computer actually do? And how does it physically work? This is what's called a logic gate. It's the fundamental building block of all computers, including the device you're watching this video on. The idea is pretty simple. It takes in two inputs, each a one or a zero, on or off, and it generates an output of the same form, also a one or a zero. Logic gates come in a variety of different types for different purposes, each with a different pattern of inputs to outputs. This one is what's known as an XNOR, or equivalence gate. It performs a straightforward function to compare the two inputs and output a one if they're the same and a zero if they're not. For example, if both inputs are zero, it will return a one. And if both inputs are one, it will also return a one. If one input is zero and the other is one, it will return a zero. On its own, the equivalent gate is not hugely impressive. It simply tells us whether two signals are the same or not but connect the output to the input of another gate and that to another, and you have the beginning of a logical network. The larger the network, the more complex the questions it can answer. Build it out enough and eventually you'll have something you can ask, what is the largest prime number under 1 billion? Or even what is the best way to cook rice? And that's what you have in a modern computer, a network of hundreds of millions of logic gates all working in unison to process the complex information it's given. So where does energy come into all this? Going back to our equivalence gate, we need to think specifically about the number of input and output combinations it can have. Let's start with inputs, with two bits, each of which can be independently one or zero. We get a total of four possibilities. What about the outputs? This is even simpler. Since the gate only outputs one bit, there are only two possible output states, one or zero. As soon as we start talking about states, a certain someone called Ludwig Boltzmann becomes very interested. Boltzmann was one of the first to start using the concept of entropy as a measure of our knowledge, or rather, our ignorance. He introduced the idea that the more states a system can be in, the higher its entropy. Say we've got one light, which can either be on or off. Without seeing for yourself, 
how would you go about determining whether it's on or off? You know it can only be in one of two states, so you might just ask, is the light on? If the answer is no, you'll know it's off. And if the answer is yes, you'll know it's on. Another way of putting this is, you're one yes or no question away from knowing the state of the system. You need one bit of information to quell your uncertainty. If we add a second light, the number of possible states increases, either both on, both off, the first off and the second on, or the first on and the second off. Now the system can be in one of four states. How many questions do you need to ask to know the state of the lights now? You could ask, is the first light off? And when you have your answer, you need to ask about the second light too. Is the second light on? Then you'll know the state of the two lights. You could ask other questions too, like, are the lights opposite or are the lights both on? But unless you get lucky on the first try, you'll still need to ask at least one other question. So in this case, you need two bits of information to quell your uncertainty. In this way, there's more uncertainty around the light system that can be in more possible states. Boltzmann reframed this as, the more states a system can be in, the higher its entropy. A very famous law in physics is the second law of thermodynamics. It states that the total entropy of a system can only ever increase or stay the same. It can never go down. I've made a video which goes way more into entropy and the second law of thermodynamics called Why Time Actually Flows Both Ways. I've linked it in the description if you'd like to watch it. Anyway, in the 1870s, Boltzmann first wrote down the equation for entropy as equaling Kb log W, where Kb is a very small constant, but more importantly, W is the number of states the system can be in. Let's apply this to our logic gate. We said earlier there are four possible input states. Putting that into the formula, we get an entropy of Kb log 4. After the operation has been carried out, there are two states. This gives an entropy of Kb log 2. But wait a second. This means that the entropy of the gate actually goes down after the operation. Have we just broken the second law of thermodynamics? Not quite. We don't need to panic or celebrate just yet. The second law doesn't ban any decreases in entropy, it just says that the total entropy never goes down. You actually see this every time you open your fridge. When you put something in and it begins to cool, this corresponds to a decrease in its entropy. But this isn't breaking any laws, because the lost heat is released by the fridge back into the surrounding air. The total entropy of the can plus the fridge plus the air has not gone down. In fact, it's gone up. So for the logic gate to not violate the second law, it must somehow produce a compensating increase in entropy so that the total doesn't decrease. And this is exactly what happens. Specifically, the gate produces a unit of heat energy equal to the change in entropy multiplied by the temperature of the system. Then, just as with the fridge, the release of this heat ensures that the total entropy of the system as a whole is unchanged. And so, we have the Landauer limit, the minimum energy we need to expend to run an operation on our equivalence gate. But the result is much more general than that. It applies to all the gates you find in a modern computer. Any logical operation with fewer output states than input states must produce heat to keep overall entropy from decreasing. The limit was first proposed in 1961 by physicist Rolf Landauer while working at IBM. The remarkable thing is that we don't have to know anything about how our logical gate actually works. It doesn't matter if it uses transistors, valves, or photons. All we know is that if there are fewer output states than input states, the laws of physics guarantee it must consume a certain quantity of energy. This is why it's sometimes said that the Landauer limit gives the energy value of information itself. So exactly how much energy is this? At room temperature, where T equals about 300 degrees Kelvin, the energy needed to perform one logical operation is this tiny, tiny, tiny number of joules, where a joule is the unit of energy. That's a really small amount, about 100 times less than the energy of a single photon of visible light. But that's just the theoretical calculation. In practice, we're still some way off achieving this. 
The most advanced computers today still use many millions of times more energy than the limit requires, mostly due to the kind of waste losses we talked about earlier. But even so, some researchers are looking to the future. Sure, the Landauer limit might not be the main obstacle now, but the more we continue to improve computing, the more it will come to be the primary constraint. And if we're ever going to build computers that run at truly sci-fi level speeds, we will need to overcome it at some point. So it's better that we start thinking of solutions now. So what ideas might we try to lower the Landauer limit? One is simply to cool the computer down. Just now we saw that the information energy cost is KBT log W for one operation. This temperature term T means that the colder we get the computer, the lower the Landauer limit will be. If we kept our computer in a freezer at about minus 18 degrees Celsius, the limit would be 15% lower than at room temperature. Or we could go even further. Liquid nitrogen has a temperature of minus 196 degrees Celsius, which means if we ran this over our processor, the limit would drop by a whole 72%. In fact, some researchers have cooled processes down to within one degree of absolute zero, dropping the Landauer limit by over a factor of 100. But all these methods have the same problem. Cooling things down requires energy. And the colder you want to keep something, the more energy this needs. So in reality, trying to eliminate the Landauer limit by cooling actually ends up using more energy than it saves. No, something better is needed. If we want to truly overcome the limit, we need something fundamentally different, something which dodges the need for information energy altogether. We need a totally new way to think about computing. Introducing Reversible computers. What is a reversible computer and what does it have to do with the Landauer limit? To answer this, we return once again to our equivalence gate. Remember, it takes two bits, checks if they're the same, returns a one if they are and a zero if they aren't. This is what's called an irreversible operation. It means that if all we do is look at the output, it's impossible to know what the inputs were. For example, suppose we see an output of 1. This tells us that the inputs were the same, either both 0 or both 1. But without looking at one of the inputs, it's impossible to tell which. If you think about it, the reason for this is simple. We saw earlier that there are four input combinations, but only two for the output. This makes it impossible to match up the combinations one to one. There will always be at least one output state matching multiple input states, making it impossible to trace back. From a mathematical point of view, this is what it actually means to be reversible. You have fewer possible output states than input states. What's more, it was this difference in the number of input and output states which gives us the decrease in entropy, which ultimately leads to the Landauer limit. So it's actually the irreversibility of the operation which produces the energy cost. If irreversibility is the problem, might there be some way to make our equivalence gates not irreversible? Reversible? It turns out the answer is yes. Logically, it's actually quite easy. All we need to do is add a second bit to the output and set it to always equal one of the inputs. Now, if we look at the input and the output states, we can see that for each output, there's exactly one input. This means that it's always possible to work backwards from the output state to the input state, and so the operation has become reversible. So what about entropy? Well, by adding this second output bit, we've increased the number of output states to four, the same as the number of input states. Since there's no change in the number of possible states, there's no change in information entropy, and so no need for any energy to be produced. In other words, no Landauer limit. So is that it then? Problem solved? Well, not quite. While we may have designed a reversible version of the equivalence operation, we still need to build a physical gate to actually carry it out. And unfortunately, this is the hard part. Why? Can't we just add a second output to the existing gate, say by inserting a connection straight between the second input and the second output? This will give us the right outputs for the right inputs, after all. 
The problem here is, while the operation performed is logically reversible, the gate itself is not physically reversible. Imagine we put the 1-1 one, one signal backwards through the gate. One of the bits will go straight through to the input, yes, but the other will reach the original equivalence gate and not know which way to go. Another way of viewing the problem is that you can't make an irreversible system into a reversible one just by adding extra components to it. Our original equivalence gate doesn't know that it's now part of a logically reversible circuit and so will still consume the same amount of energy as it did before. Instead, you have to go back to the very beginning. You need to create something which is reversible from start to finish, down to the smallest component. You have to fundamentally rethink your computer design. Could such a thing be done? In 1982, Fredkin and Toffoli proposed the billiard ball computer, a thought experiment about a device which, instead of using electrical signals, uses billiard balls to perform its logical operations. The idea is that the balls are fed into pipes in the machine, representing ones and zeros, where they then collide with each other to produce logical outputs. For example, with one design, they can be made to form an AND gate. If only one ball is entered at either input pipe, it goes straight through and nothing emerges from the AND output pipe. However, if two balls are entered at the same time, they collide and one is directed to the output. In this way, the system is able to replicate exactly the logic of a conventional AND gate. But most importantly of all, since the balls all follow straight collision trajectories, the process works exactly the same way backwards as it does forwards. The billiard ball computer is fully physically reversible. As a result, it produces no change in entropy during its operation and so avoids the need to expend any energy. Now, in reality, no collision is completely free of energy loss and unless we want computers to be the size of cities, using billiard balls inside them is not an option. But the thought experiment shows that there's nothing within the laws of physics that says a computer gate can't be fully reversible. Whether it be with colliding balls or clever electrical engineering, there is no reason why we could not one day make a computer which defeats the Landau limit opening a world of possibilities for the future of computing. Those of you who've been following the channel for a while know that my background is in physics, but it's topics like these that got me more and more into computer science, seeing just how amazing computers are and the power of what they can do. But to be honest, when I first started learning computer science, I found it, well, pretty dry. I need visuals, story, and active problem solving to help keep me engaged. With Brilliant, learning computer science has been so much easier and, well, just fun. Through interactive exercises and fun stories, you learn way more than by passive reading. In their Computer Science Fundamentals course, you learn how computers accomplish all the amazing things that they do, from recognizing faces, beating world champions at chess, and driving automated vehicles. I was genuinely surprised at how the simplest processes can turn into what seems like magic if only you know how to assemble them. If you've always wondered how computers work but didn't know where to start, I highly recommend this Computer Science Fundamentals course from Brilliant. They have loads of other courses as well on math, physics, computer science and general science. I often use Brilliant to brush up on a topic when I'm writing a video. Brilliant are offering the first 200 people 20% off the annual premium membership when you sign up with the link in the description or you can go to brilliant.org slash up and Adam and start discovering today. Thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode and thank you for watching it. Bye!